Please welcome Daniel Colburn. What's up, everybody? How are we doing? I'm a little scared because every time I get yelled at on Twitter, I go, I wonder if this guy's Dutch. <laughs> and he's always Dutch. So, you know, me and the Dutch, we have a little of a tenuous history, you know? They really like PHP Storm and DDD and, you know, some of these things. I get yelled at a little bit on the internet, but it's fine. You've all been very friendly, very kind, and I'm, I'm super glad to be here. So, I'm Daniel. That's me. Uh, that picture was taken in Sydney. I was pointing at the Sydney Opera House, but I removed it. Um, I am one of the founders of Thunk. Thunk is a small product agency, so we do uh, product consulting and uh, development consulting. So my co-founder is that guy John. He's really strong. Um, John is an excellent PM, and he does really great uh, product consulting. So. He helps people figure out what they want to build. I help them figure out how they're going to build it. Uh, and so we employ a couple of people. And with our team, we go into companies and help them build cool stuff. One of the things uh, we are really excited about that we've been working on recently is called Verbs. Uh, Verbs is a package for event sourcing. Uh, it's for Laravel, and it's supposed to feel really good. Um, Verbs is not DDD, and we like it that way. Uh, it's, it's a very casual, very easy, very simple, very Zonda uh, event sourcing package. This is Chris Morrell. Uh, Chris used to be my boss, now he's my friend. Um, and Chris and I built Verbs together. But we'll hear more about Chris later. Ah, <sighs> verbs, verbs, verbs. So uh, I launched Verbs at uh, Laracon Australia, um, and it was really fun. It was a blast to go down there and uh, see a bunch of the people who are here now speaking. Uh, but when we launched Verbs, uh, you know, we put it out into the world, and then we started using it in our own projects, and a, f a couple of other people have started using it in their projects. And uh, we've been sort of tightening up, adding things to it, and uh, we're starting to have a really great time building things with Verbs, and I think you will too if you play with it. But this is a war story. So if you've been a developer for a long time, you've definitely seen some stuff, right? You've been into a code base, and you, you know where the bodies are buried. Legacy code. You know you have some. Some people say, I don't have legacy code, because code, legacy code is untested code, and all of my code is tested. I have 100% test coverage. Pest told me so. And so I have no legacy code. But uh, every company has legacy code. Uh, Caleb Porzio, buddy of mine, who I do a podcast with, No Plans to Merge, he was recently on the uh, Laravel Worldwide Meetup online, and he was giving a talk, and he said, legacy code is any code you resent. Uh, and I think every developer has a little bit of code that they resent. Devs know where the bodies are buried. You know where it's at. You know there's that server that's running that code that you haven't touched in 10 years, and it just works fine, and it's not a problem, right? But eventually, Something, PHP 5.6 gets end of life, and someone needs to go figure out how this, how this code works. It's got procedural P, 10,000 line files, dbconnect.php. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about. You got one of these. But we all know how to deal with legacy code pretty well. There's a million conference talks, a million books, a million blog posts about how to deal with legacy code, right? You write some acceptance tests, red, green, refactor, you repeat until it's good, all your tests are passing. It's legacy code. You can deal with legacy code. But legacy data, <sighs> legacy data gets pretty dark. You've got unused columns. You ever come into a code base? So I'm a, you know, I work for an agency. I run an agency, and so we'll go into all kinds of code bases. I've onboarded into probably 50 code bases in the last 10 years, right? And so I get to a company, and I'm starting to figure out their code base and figure out what's going on. Like, hey, what is this? And they're like, oh, I don't think we're using that column anymore. I'm like, hmm, OK. I was like, oh, but this table. Like, what about this table? And he's like, oh, we used to use that table, but I don't think we do anymore. <laughs> and there's these magic strings. You know, you've got 
uh, you know, the title of the post is over here and then the comments are linked to the posts by their titles. You know, you've got all kinds of weird database schemas. The primary keys are weird. The tables have weird capitalization. You just end up in these weird databases. You've seen these. You get situationships, anything to avoid a relationship. <laughs> Just big, bad, nasty schemas. If you've never seen one of these, I'm happy for you. But you live long enough, you will. Refactoring legacy data sucks. Uh, there's a few common approaches. These are what they are. Trash it and start over. Now, I'm actually a huge fan of this approach. I think this is actually one of the best ways to deal with the problem, if you can. But you can't always do it, right? But if you can, just do it, just back up the data, throw it on S3, you know, and uh, start over. But if you can't, say you actually need this data for some reason, I don't know. Uh, compatibility layers is an interesting approach. Uh, so Stripe actually does this. So if you hit a different version of a Stripe API endpoint than the data was stored in, Stripe behind the scenes is actually running that data through multiple mutators to mutate the data and upgrade it to the latest version of the API. Um, so that's something you can do, but you know, if you need to directly query the database, that's not an option. You actually need to get that data up to date. So inevitably, what ends up happening is the heroic data migration, right? You've all been on a heroic data migration. This is when someone says, well, okay, so what if we all got up at two in the morning and we write a big script and we'll start it running, and then that way, if anything goes wrong, it's two in the morning and there won't be that many people online and maybe we can fix it. <laughs> These are scary and they're not fun and I just don't want to do any more of them. <laughs> so every one of these has a moment where you flip the switch, right? There's this moment where you're like, okay, we're on the old data and all of a sudden everyone's on the call, we're all on Zoom or whatever, on Tuple, you know? And then, or you're gonna be like, okay, I'm running the command, ready, ready, boom. Okay, now the DNS is redirected or uh, we flipped the feature flag, and now we're, now we're using the new database, right? And sometimes you can, you can undo it, but sometimes you can't undo it, right? Sometimes you flip the switch, it's flipped. And uh, if it didn't work, you got problems. <laughs> there must be a better way to deal with legacy data. This is a true story, mostly. Mostly true story. There are some lies, uh, but mostly it's true. So I used to work at this place and there was a server and the server's name was Host Zero and we called it Host O. And Host O was the server with all the 10,000 line files and the dbconnect.php and all the mess, right? And Host O got like a million visits a month, right? It was, all, it was a heavily used part of the application and it was really kind of the core of the business was the stuff happening on Hosto. So over time, they had built this really great Laravel app and they had migrated almost everything over. So there's one big thing left to migrate, asterisk. <laughs> the exam system. So the exam system was simple. Students would come in, there were exams, the exams had questions, the questions had answers, the students would get scores. It's a simple system, right? What could be the problem? Well, there's also retries, right? So sometimes you're allowed to retry a question depending on very specific rules. And then also like the, the questions would be updated over time, right? And so we've got all these magic strings going on in this database. So there, there was a lot, of, a lot of mess around that. And some questions got partial credit. Uh, and then also this was all submitting to 50 different government systems. So there was a lot of audits. So the data needed to be right. <laughs> It was a scary schema. So uh, this is a little small, but this is an example of kind of what the database looked like, right? So we had the question text. We've got what exam it's for, Laravel for the Dutch. Is it nice to yell at people about DDD? Only when I'm right. Um, so we have magic strings here, right? The exam name is a magic string. Uh, we don't have a relationship to answers. Instead, we have three different columns called answer one text, answer two text, and answer three text. Uh, I don't know what these columns even are. What is a val column? And then I've got a Boolean that's null over there. I don't know. Is that true or false? <laughs> um, so then this is our answers table, very similar, right? We're still, 
using the magic strings, still no answers relationship. I don't know what an attempt is. And everything has points, apparently. It was something like this. I don't know. I, it's been a while. I don't exactly remember the database schema, but I recreated this from memory, right? This is my pain manifested here for you. We need to Zonda this up a little bit. You guys familiar with Zonda? Who's not familiar with Zonda? Okay, so back in the day, back in the, back in the OG Laravel days, uh, the DHH had a car. It was that car, a Pagani Zonda. And uh, Adam Wathen and Taylor and Matt and Jeffrey and all those guys used to just say that anything that was good, anything that was good laravel -y vibes was Zonda, right? And so there were Zondas and Nondas. So anyway, clearly we would love a new schema, a really Zonda schema, you know, something like this maybe. You know, we'd have a questions table, an answers table, a responses table, and a scores table. And they'd all be related with IDs because it's, you know, relationships. We could have a, it has many or uh, uh, belongs to relationship. But that seemed like it wasn't an option. <laughs> Why? We have a big problem here. We have 15 years of data. We've got millions and millions of rows of data, and some of it's got null booleans in it. So <laughs> and we really don't understand how the old system works. There's no tests, right? It's just big, huge PHP template files with random business logic shoved into them. We think we know how it works. We know how it's theoretically supposed to work, but we don't really know how it works. And it can't go down. So we racked our brains for months. Uh, every stand-up, every sprint planning meeting, everything, we talked about this problem. So we just started to rewrite it like we wanted it, you know? We're like, we'll figure out the data migration later. Maybe it will suck. Maybe we'll have to take the whole website down for two days. But <laughs> for now, let's just rewrite the system and build it how we wish we had built it in the first case. We knew the data migration was going to suck, but that's a problem for future us. But then someone said the six words that changed the course of my life forever. Have you heard of event sourcing? <laughs> so we did some learning. We started investigating event sourcing, and we basically learned that event sourcing is deriving the state of the world from a stored record of what happened. Right? So we're going to store what happened, all of the events that led up to the current moment, and then we're going to figure out what shape our data is based on what happened. Something happens, an event is stored, and then models are written. So something happens. Someone answers a question in the exam. An event is stored. It might be called a question answered event, right? And then models are written. So maybe a question response model is created, an eloquent model. Something like that. Who cares? Well, stored events can be replayed. So that's the interesting thing, right? So we've got all these events stored, this log of everything that ever happened, right? And when those events happen, we're writing them out to database tables. But we could, if we wanted to, just delete all the contents of that database table and replay the events, and it would be regenerated exactly the same as the first time. Or, or more interestingly, we could change the way that that data was generated. So we could delete that database table and replay those events into a completely different schema. See where this is going? So a plan began to evolve. I'm going to take you on a journey here. OK, so the trash can is the legacy system. The rocket ship is the Laravel app. <laughs> so in between the trash can and the rocket ship, we put a database table called events, right? And so from our legacy system, we started just storing events. You know, We're not doing anything with them. We're just going to put them in there. So when the, when the legacy system did something, we would fire an event, and that would get stored in the database. That was step one. Then step two, we would go and try and generate the same data that we already had in the legacy system from those events again to see if we really understood how the system worked. And that gave us a really good opportunity to write some tests. Then our new Laravel app was also going to generate events that were going to go into that same database table. And then when those events were fired, we would also generate our eloquent models for our new Laravel app. And we get this beautiful infinity sign, and it's symmetrical, and that's how you know it's good. <laughs> so anytime any events are being fired, whether it's by the old system or the new system, they're being projected out into data for both systems. Does this make sense? We following? 
So running through it again with words this time. We're going to fire and store events from the legacy code. This is what an event looks like. It's a class, PHP class. It's got three properties. So a question answered. It was answered by a user. Which question was it? What answer did they choose? Right? Simple. This is what the database table full of events looks like. It's what type of event is it? And a big JSON blob full of messy, gross data. So we're cap capturing live legacy data as events in real time. So as things are happening in our live system, we're sticking them in a table. So step two is mirror the legacy data from the event. So take those events that we've been storing, regenerate them into a new table called like legacy answers mirror or something, and just see if the data is the same. And if it's not the same, great. That's an opportunity for us to figure out what's going on in the system that we didn't already understand. You know there was no bottled water in this entire place. I had to go next door to get bottled water. <laughs> I'm glad I did. Um, oh no, I just spilled water on the remote. I hope it still works. Um, OK, so then the question answered event, we're going to add a handler. Now you could add this somewhere else in your code base in an event listener of some kind. Uh, but it's easier to explain if I just stick in a handle method. So we're going to pull up that mirror data table that we talked about. We're just going to insert the gross stuff into it that represents our current data structure. Step three, we're going to event source all the models in our Laravel rewrite. So here's a regular old Laravel controller, right? It's a store method. So when someone answers a question, we're going to create an eloquent model called an exam response, and it's going to have user ID, question ID, answer ID. So all we're going to do is swap that out. Instead of creating the event, or instead of creating the model, we're just going to fire a question answered event. And then back in our handle method for that event, in addition to sticking data into the legacy table mirror, we're going to just create an eloquent model. And then we're going to test it, right? We're going to just keep testing over time that the data we're generating is the data we expect. We're going to let it run in production for a little bit, right? And so over time, as people are using the real system, are we generating the data we expect? Then we're going to start backfilling events slowly. So we're going to say, hey, for the first 50 rows of this table before we turn this on, let's generate some events and then run them, replay them, and see if we get the data we expect. Then we'll do it for 100, then we'll do it for 1,000, then we'll do it for 10,000, then we'll do it for a million. And we're going to programmatically check along the way that we're generating the data we expect. And eventually, we'll end up in this situation, the perfect infinity sign. Then we get to flip the switch. But we get to flip the switch slowly, right? Because both of our systems are live at the same time. Data in the new system creates data in the old system. Data in the old system creates data in the new system. So we have an extremely casual deploy. We start with 5% of the users, right? So we, you could do this with Laravel Pennant or some feature flag system. We did it with Nginx rules. But whatever, whatever your plan is, you put 5% of your users over here, and the rest of them stay on the legacy system. Right? And then you're talking to those 5% of users. Hey, how's it going? Anything going wrong? You having a good time? You like it? If they do, then we go up to 20%. If they like it, no problems, we move it up to 95% of the users. Leave those last 5% of really problematic, scary customers who we don't want to piss off. And then, when we're really, really, really confident that it's good, we can fully launch 100% of the users. Right? We move everyone over. But then, if something goes wrong, super easy. We just turn on the old system. All the old data, or all the data that was generated by the new system, is working just fine in the old system, because we tested that super thoroughly ahead of time. All the data is backed up in events, right? So there, one of the things about legacy data is you end up with these tables full of data that are just, there's so much data, you know? And you probably don't need all of it. You definitely don't need all of it to run your business logic. But it's scary to throw away data. No one likes to throw away data, you know? And so the beautiful thing about an events table is you have a big JSON blob full of nasty data. You can just stick it all in there. And then if you realize that you ever needed any of it that you accidentally threw away, just reproject your events. You got the data. It's like you never got rid of it. You've got fully auditable models with just the right data. So you can stick as little data as possible into your new tables. But if anyone ever needs that data, it's there. 
And it all worked perfectly and there were zero problems at the end. Um, actually, it did all work perfectly and there were zero problems, but you know, that's not always gonna be the case, right? And if it weren't, that we had so many contingencies for rolling this back, right? This is, a, this is an extremely safe deploy process. Oh, by the way, so this is Chris Morrell, uh, the guy who I built verbs with from the beginning. So this whole project happened when he was my boss. So I used to work for Chris at an organization. So Chris and I basically did this project together. This was sort of the two of us sitting down and figuring out event sourcing. We used the Spotsy Laravel event sourcing package and we bought their course and we studied and we read the documentation and we learned event sourcing from the ground up for this package. And it wasn't a traditional event sourcing use case. You know, whenever, whenever someone tells you about event sourcing, it's a bank account, you know, and it's like, oh, there's gonna be money deposited events and money withdrawn events and that's gonna calculate our balance. Or like analytics is another really common use case where it's like, oh, well, every time a user likes a post, we'll add it to the number of likes or whatever. It's for aggregating data. This was not for aggregating data at all. This was for transforming data. And so it was a really interesting use case. And over time, Chris and I, you know, I went, I left the company. I went off and started freelancing and eventually started my own company. But Chris and I have stayed very close friends. We play Hearthstone together. And uh, we just kept talking about event sourcing and all of the ways that we wanted event sourcing to be just a little different, you know? And we just thought, this could feel a lot more Laravel, you know? And so Verbs was this thing that we had just talked about for like three years of just like, I would go up to Philadelphia where he lives and we would like get coffee and talk about, man, we should really make an event sourcing package, <laughs> you know? And so eventually we just, we just did it. Um, and now we've got multiple clients at Thunk who were building applications for using Verbs and it's some of the most productive code I've ever written. Like I'm having such a blast building like Livewire and Verbs apps for clients. It's a blast. So coming up soon, Verbs is in alpha on the website. There's a big banner that says don't use this in production. We are ignoring that advice and some other people are ignoring that advice and it's going fine for them. But, you know, just to be a good person, I figured I should say don't use it in production yet. But we know what's missing from 1.0 uh, and we know how to get there. And so I'm gonna be telling you soon, not today, about the Verbs 1.0 roadmap. Uh, the Verbs documentation. So the Verbs documentation was born out of the development of Verbs, right? So as we were building Verbs, we were documenting the bridge in front of us as we were building it, right? But that led to a really scattered documentation. It's not, it's not a whole story. It's just little features documented here and there. So we know that needs to be rewritten. We're in the middle of that rewrite right now. That's coming super soon. Uh, Verbs Livewire. So all of the apps we're building with Verbs right now are also Livewire apps. That's not required, but it's just how we like to build applications. And it's super fast and super fun. And there's a couple of little convenience affordances that we've built to make building Livewire apps with Verbs even cleaner. That's also coming super soon. Verbs commands. What if every event source Verbs app got a command palette, like a command K, run an event from the command palette for free and keyboard shortcuts for free? It's totally doable, we're launching it soon. Verbs history, what if all of your eloquent models had super detailed history about everything that had ever happened to that model? And a little blade component that you could just include to render that history on the page. That's also coming super soon. But if you wanna hear more about all those, you gotta get to India. Because <laughs> next month, we're talking about all of that stuff in India. I wanted to come here and tell the story about what inspired me to get into event sourcing, right? Because it really was like a psychedelic experience, right? I, when I saw this way of building applications, I just, like, I, it was like I had never really understood anything before. Um, and it really turned me on to a whole way of thinking about applications. Um, so I wanted to come tell you guys this story just to, to make the case for some use case for event sourcing that isn't just bank, bank accounts, you know? It's such a boring example. Right? This is such a dirty, messy, real world example of like, I have 10 million rows of terrible data. What can I do with it? And event sourcing is a great solution for that. 
GG. Good man. I got questions. Yes. So, Jan is asking, you flipped the switch, but eventually did you kill the switch? Yes, actually, but we didn't have to do it immediately, right? So we got to wait like three months, right? So we just let the application run for three months, and when we eventually had no problems, then we did the trash it and move on strategy where we dumped the database, stuck it in like a GZ file and stuck it on S3 forever, you know? So that database dump still exists if the FBI needs it or something, but, uh, you know, eventually we stopped putting data into that database because we just didn't need it anymore. Good. Nate Daly is asking for a friend, mm -hmm. I believe so, which is better? Verbs or spot, spacy event sourcing? Um, probably spacy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they're both great. Spacy is a more traditional event sourcing package. They use, so verbs doesn't use the same words as spacy, right? So the words of a, the language of event sourcing comes from DDD, right? And so, d uh, sorry, domain driven design, right? Um, and DDD is this whole thing, right? <laughs> it's a big, cult, um, <laughs> and uh, it's full of Dutch guys, and they yell at me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> no, but DDD is, uh, is a whole thing, and we didn't want the barrier to be, I understand DDD before I can do event sourcing, right? We wanted to make event sourcing more accessible without having to go all the way down. So if you want to just do that, try verbs. If you know what you want, and what you want is DDD, like, verbs is using, or, so the spacy package is using the same words as DDD, right? So if, if that's the approach that you want to take, you can use that package. Thank you. Also, the guys who made it are here, and they're geniuses. I talked to them for a while today. Good friends? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you look worried. They supported uh, our use case forever while we were building it. Okay. And last question from hmm, the anonymous user. Are you going to dance in India? I think it's required, right? <laughs> Do I have an option? Nope. Okay, that's my thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A big applause for Daniel. Thank you.